Hello and welcome to Podtoid. We are your host. I'm CJ. I'm Chris. I'm Charlotte. I'm Occam's. And this is episode 415. There is a plane flying over me. God damn, I hate this apartment. Uh, anyways, <laughs> we have a good show for you guys today. Uh, Dan is out this week, but we are going to press on. Uh, on today's show, we're going to talk some mm-hmm. Tokyo Game Show that happened last week. And Charlotte's going to fill us in on whatever the hell the infectious madness of Dr. Decker is. Very excited to hear about that, Charlotte. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've got kind of, it, it's got a lukewarm reception from me. So it's it, the title is more exciting than the contents, I'm afraid. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Um, before we get going, how's everyone doing this week? Everyone doing good? Yes. I'm all right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting a tooth pulled out of my face tomorrow. Party Ooh. time. Ooh. Ooh. I'll give you cash money for that tooth, straight up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get to keep it last time. I was so disappointed. Yeah, they're real weird uh, about that. you got to find a cool dentist. Mm. I'll, I'll give you cash money if I can pull the tooth. <laughs> I mean, last week I was willing. Like The problem is it's not grown in far enough. Otherwise, I would have just tied a string around it and yanked it out. Like, this is, I'm not Oops. like... A hillbilly who's losing all my teeth. These are my wisdom teeth I'm talking about. So, Tie the string around it? Are you a cartoon character? <laughs> I was I was so desperate to get it out of my face. It's like I, I booked... I must be the only person in the world who books having a tooth taken out in preparation for starting a new job. Because it's been bothering me for years and I've been putting it off for years. And I thought, when I start my new job... I don't want to be taking time off to have an operation, so I'll just get it done. And last week, it decided to flare up. Like, you know, there's 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 nothing like fucking toothache either. Like, it's just the worst. And you talk about like the string around it. The amount of times where I've been in a situation where it's been so bad that you're um, you, you're lying. You know, it's four in the morning or whatever, and you're lying there, and you're genuinely like. <sighs> Surely this can't be much worse than like getting a pair of pliers and just pulling it out. Mm, but then, yeah. but but then you go to the dentist and say if the dentist has it, it does pull it. You see the fight they have, and you're just like, "How the fuck did I think I was going to do this to my, be able to do this to myself with like a pair of pliers?" <laughs> but um, there, but there's 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 nothing like toothache. I'm glad you're getting it sorted. Yeah. Yeah, though you say like the them having to like pull really hard. Last time, I swear he put his leg on my chair to yank it out. <laughs> Had to get leverage. I definitely remember doing a thing where I like put my my like, like wrapped my arms underneath the arms of the seat, so I was kind of latched in, so I could hold myself <laughs> backwards. I remember it, like having to do that once. So mm. I don't know where I get this idea. Like when I've got toothache, it's like you know what? I'll just take it out myself. Hold on. Are you guys not put under when you have your teeth taken out? No. Nope. What? No. Nope. I'm insane. having an injection. I mean, you don't feel anything. You, you 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 can feel pressure, and it's a bit disturbing having the dentist like literally have to like put weight behind pulling your teeth out, tooth out. But it's you can't feel anything. So when um. I had my wisdom teeth pulled, it, I felt like I just blinked. That's how quickly it went by because I was only only uh, under for an hour. And so I just right. go under with, with hurting teeth and then wake up with a mouth that feels like all my teeth have moved. I, I could I mean, not imagine being awake. To be no, fair, I, they, do, they do do that if you have all four out at once. But if you only have one out, which they often they try to only do them one at a time, um, like my dentist does because it's too traumatic to have multiple out if they can avoid it. And um, yeah, if it's just one or two and you've got, no really like diagnosable fear of going to the dentist then they just give you an injection and, and numb it so hmm. my, uh, my my goal is to stay awake from my colonoscopy <laughs> <laughs> well, well well i did i did that last year you stayed uh, awake yeah did you like go on like a, a rising i had i had a colonoscopy last year and i didn't go under for it or anything i was like awake all the way through it did you that watch like, it on the video screen yeah, it looked like microcosm for the Amiga CD32. <laughs> <laughs> See, what I think they should do is put like a 3D camera inside of people and then give you 3D glasses so you can really be immersed on the inside of your colon. Right. <laughs> it was it was literally it was it was literally I think a, it was like a year to the day, a year to, a year ago today. But like um the one thing I really remember about it 
other than how like haunting and horrifying it was, was like the the wand that they used like strobes multiple colors. <laughs> so, and I guess that's because if they if they have it all one color, then everything will always look the same underneath the light. But if they have it go white, then red, then green, then blue, then they can look for anomalies that are like different colors. But when you're looking at the screen, it just looks like there's a rave going on inside your ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just Studio 54 is alive and well inside your ass. <laughs> right. It's, it's, it, it, it's funny I can laugh about this now, considering I was absolutely fucking petrified. <laughs> uh, you know, Charlotte, if you are mm-hmm. able to keep the tooth, I was just thinking a few weeks ago, the hottest thing was... Gamer Girl Bathwater. Surely Gamer Girl Tooth could be pulling a small fortune for you. Yeah, but I can only sell it once. Eh. Like, I'd have to either like pow- powder it down or like get veneers put in. <laughs> uh, all right, let's go ahead and let's kick things off. But before we get into the games, I, um, I do have another question for all of you besides how your week was. Um, have any of you ever been fired from a job before? Nope, I'm a good girl. No. I've been made redundant, but I've not been fired. Yeah, same here. Oh, well, actually, that is a very good thing to bring up, Chris, because that is what we were talking about today. Top story of our show, we're going to go to New Zealand, where according to the New Zealand Herald, a man employed at FCB, which is an advertising company, was alerted to the fact that he was going to be called into a redundancy meeting. And for our listeners, if you don't know what a redundancy meeting is, it's where your boss tells you your job is redundant and they fire you. Um. So this man was given advance notice that this is what he would be going to. This meeting would be about his redundancy. And so he knew it was coming. And the company allowed him uh, to bring someone with him to the meeting for support. But instead of bringing like his wife or his partner or a sibling or a friend, this gentleman decided to bring in a emotional support clown. (laughs) The dude hired a clown to be there when he got fired, and it really seems he got his money's worth. Uh, According to the story, throughout the meeting, the clown was apparently making balloon animals for everybody in the room. And when the redundancy paperwork was handed over to the man, the clown started pantomiming crying. (laughs) Uh, I I can't tell if this is like an Adam Sandler film or a Harmony Corinne film, you know? (laughs) It, it, it is a future Adam Sandler film. Mm. Um, I will say fake crying is a great touch, but if I were the clown, I would have brought a slide whistle for when he was fired. Um, <laughs> if you're wondering what happened to the man uh, who was like, oh, he did quickly find a job at a competing agency. Uh, meanwhile, the clown was released back into his natural habitat, the woods outside of an elementary school. Um, <laughs> a clown with you to get fired. You know, I, I have been let go once when they were – but they were downsizing the company, and I, I was one of the first people to be let go because I was one of the last people to be hired. Boy, I really wish I would have had a clown there with me, just like spraying my boss in the face with that water that comes out of that flower. And if, if, and like, if your boss was scared of clowns, then maybe they could just, whilst they were like making you redundant, they could just the clown could just sit and look them in the eye and like <laughs> unbreak gaze for the entire meeting. <laughs> beat, beat, Richie. <laughs> 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 All right, Tim Curry, hold up. <laughs> oh but, uh, man, that, so, that's, that's I think the best thing about the that story is how sharp the guy was to do that. Like, because I wouldn't have even thought to do it. Right. Do you know what I mean? I couldn't have thought. What if I bring in a witness and I make that witness like a professional clown? It wouldn't have even passed my mind. But now, now it's probably a thing that I bet other people are going to do it now because they're going to be like, I'm going to do what that guy did and bring it. It's like, no, it's been done. It yeah. was wicked. Don't you do it. Like, if you're listening to this thinking, I'm going to do that. No, don't. Don't. Come up with your own idea. <laughs> bring some, Bring a lion tamer with his lion. I don't know, somebody else. I don't know. Or just like yeah. a peacock. What about mine? A oh. mine. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a fun, that's a fun story, though. I like, uh, I like it. And uh, at, least, at least it kind of has a happy ending because we know that the, uh, the guy went on and got another job and the clown went on to continue terrifying people for money. Yes. What, what if the mime, what if the mime like did its mime thing, but it was reenacting uh, David Carradine's final 30 minutes of life. <laughs> <laughs> oh 
Oh, that is a great poll for people who get that joke. Um, <laughs> let's go ahead and start moving on to talking about games. And Charlotte, we're going to go ahead and start with you with this apparently sad, sadly middling game you've been playing. Tell us about the infectious madness of Dr. Decker. Um, so I have been playing other games. I'm still playing Final Fantasy 13 um, and um, puzzle games. I'm, I'm working on Persona, but I finished off the infectious madness of Dr. Decker this week and I don't get it. <laughs> um, so I, I think I mentioned this before on Podtoid. It's like an yeah. FMV game. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we finished it yesterday and um, not to spoil it, but it's like it really is like choose your own adventure. Um, and it's just, it's full of plot holes and it's the acting is, I I think the actors are good. I think the script is bad. Mm -hmm. It's just very cheesy. I think FMV games still have a bit of a way to go. Now I have, I platinumed Late Shift. Like I did as much as I could on Late Shift, which is by the same publishers and, that was in entertaining, but clearly bad. Like the acting was not good. And the script again was kind of cliched, but I mean, I think it was better than late shift in a way because it tried to do something new. So I, I mentioned before, um, you have options to question people by, um, but you can also type in your own questions and you're, you're trying to find out whether, um, whether your previous, um, the, the person who did your job before you, this, um, psychiatrist, who murdered him um and by questioning through using your own questions and by typing in you can unlock things that you otherwise couldn't if you just picked from a a, a list of questions you can pick from Mm -hmm. but we we never so we kind of knew we had to do that but we didn't really know where to get started so we didn't bother and of course then we didn't get a very good ending it's just it's just because you have this list of people who you've got to pick from to say who you think the killer is and um the game makes you think that but right up to the end you think that anybody could be the killer um and when you get to the end and you have to make a decision i was like i want i want it to be this person i think this person is a bitch and then i picked (laughs) sorry gendered language i think this person is not a very nice person i picked her in my playthrough like because there's multiple endings and different versions of the ending it wasn't she wasn't the killer and we picked everybody else and the last person we picked was you caught the killer and it's like we we didn't we had no way of knowing that that would have been the killer it just it's just a mess of storyline and it tries to be clever like it does better than late shift in the sense of it does try to do something clever but it doesn't quite pull it off because it's just so full of plot holes and doesn't have a coherent story because of it. I think this game has left me thinking at least the Wales Interactive FMVs have problems. They're not fully fledged games or decent films. Um, but I haven't played Erica yet, and I'm sure Erica Erica sounds to be much better. The problem with Erica is it's 40 gigabytes. Jeez. There's no way. Yeah, there's. I don't even... I must, I must, that must be badly optimized. I cannot imagine how an FMV, which is really just like a, it it looks like it's just one of those that is just a film with stuff laid on top of it. How the hell that can be 40 gigabytes? I do not know. But for for that reason, we haven't downloaded it because on my internet, that would take multiple days to download. So I'm going to try that at some point. We want to try the new Supermassive games. Um, one man of, I don't know how to pronounce it, Medan, Medan? I think it's a man of Medan. Medan, okay. Yeah, we're going to try that soon. Um, I mean, the closest to, it's not quite an FMV, but in that direction, I'd say the best one of, of that sort I've ever played has actually been, um, what's it called? The, the first supermassive one. Until Dawn? Until Dawn, yeah. That's my favorite of those kinds of games, sort of lumping in the the filmic game and the gamic film <laughs> versions. Yeah, um, yeah. I think Until Dawn is my favorite that, of those that I've played so far. Um, and the ones that have like films with games laid on top, I've not found any that have been particularly good, to be honest. Well, we've talked about like FMV games before, and I think we said this when we were talking about uh, this game, 
um, a couple of weeks mm -hmm. ago. FMV games, like straight up full motion video games, are like they they're always going to be hampered always because at the end of the day there are games that are not based around direct control so you can still make ones that are good like um her story but there'll always be games that are kind of even the good ones will always be games that are kind of these short one or two play experiences where the only reason to go back is to see more because at the end of the day the games are always going to be locked into all we can give you is the video we've recorded as opposed mm -hmm. to like you they're not really games you could consider speed running, if you know what I mean, or, or they're not like fighting games where you go into training and you learn stuff and you build upon the way you play the game. They're just these, they're essentially DVD chapter skips. It's just they're kind of, some of them are much more smartly um, produced than others. But that was kind of a problem that they had in like 92. And they've come back. And in a lot of ways, they're, they're way better than they used to be in terms of narrative and acting and all these kind of things. But I think they're always going to be restricted by this idea of all you're essentially doing is skipping through chapter points of a movie. Mm. Yeah. Um, through the being able to type in your own questions, I feel like Dr. Decker is trying to move away from That's that. That's really but it cool. Just, yeah. It just doesn't quite succeed. It's still... It, like people will answer questions how you're not expecting because it feels like there's been some sort of hole in the matrix, so to speak. Um, I haven't played her story or telling lies, but I gather that those are much better. But I, I feel like they are a bit of a step away from FMV in a way because they do have more interactive elements than the average FMV does. I mean, there's, there's sort of like a game overlay to those to those um games of i think right I, ha I haven't played telling lies yet but i know her story you know it's, it technically has full motion video but it's more of a puzzle game than anything mm. like there's no yeah. linear path you're going down it's just can you figure out the, the correct word to search based on what the video that you are watching yeah, I guess I guess actually Dr. Decker does try and, and borrow elements of that then because it is trying to, you have to solve a puzzle by um, figuring out what to ask people. But it's still, I don't think it's particularly well done. Um, I think part mm -hmm. of the problem, at least for me, because I, I, I adore FMV games. Uh, that shit blew me away as a kid and I still love yeah, it. Yeah, me too. But yeah, like, too. I, yeah, like the days of Phantasmagoria and... Uh, harvester and and stuff like that I, they just i don't those don't exist anymore like i don't the games they're making now seem to be smaller in scale and a little more kind of intimate but i think in the, when they do something like that you have to have really good actors then maybe that's why her story and the telling lies looks like it's, it kind of works um and you have to have it really tight and since you're trying to combine these two genres in certain ways, you need someone who knows how to make a video game and make it like the gaming elements of it. And you need someone who knows how to direct and shoot a movie. And maybe for some of it, there have, you know, someone who like, they have really good ideas, but don't have the expertise or the people around them, who know, how to, how to make that happen outside of being on paper. Um, and for me, I just wish we could go back to the days of just batshit crazy stuff, like another, like another harvester, but with the graphics and, the technical capabilities we have now. That would be fucking wonderful for me. All right, moving on. Uh, Chris, you are next. What have you been playing this past week? I haven't played too much this week. I basically um, put my time into like two shooters. Um, this weekend, I've been playing the Call of Duty Modern Warfare beta that went up, which is a different beta from the one uh, from a few weeks ago. This one's a more open multiplayer. With It has like a selection of modes in it. Um, I'll be writing about this tomorrow. So... In summary, it has like it has like team deathmatch and domination, and it has this new mode called Cyber Attack, which sounds like the mode from like a video game in like two thousand and one. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Modern Warfare Cyber Attack. Right. I think you see, we we had to stop using the word cyber after nineteen ninety nine. I think. But um, uh, other than that, I played the DLC for Metro Exodus, which is called the Two Colonels, and that's just this really heavy story-based dlc it's way more cutscenes and conversations and talking and dialogue than it is um action and it's about two hours long and it's set before the main campaign and it's about this guy colonel uh klebnikov and he he's it's his final days essentially that's not really a spoiler to say they make it quite obvious but mm -hmm. and 
it starts with like the beginning of the year and he's in his metro and he's like an OSCOM officer who are kind of the, the peacekeepers, you know, the police there. And the year starts and everyone's having a great time in that metro and the civilians are happy and he's got friends and everyone's getting on with stuff. And then like they start, uh, he's pulled aside at the New Year's Eve party and he's told we're running out of anti-radiation stuff and we're going to have to start rationing it. And if it gets worse, we're going to have to start taking it back off the people and spreading it and kind of like thin and spreading it out a little more. And then what the, and the game kind of flashes forward and what the story of this DLC basically is, is you're essentially the state versus the uprising of the civilians who are rioting and trying to kill you, but only because you're taking away all their food and medicine. And it's your team that's doing that. So as, as, as Klebnikov, you start off and you're just kind of following orders, but then it gets a bit like, we need to start gunning down all these civilians because they're like, they're like smashing up the, uh, they're going to break into the, uh, into the armory. And it's like, yeah, but they're all, they're all, all their families are dying. Like, that's why they're trying to break into the armory. So the game purposefully puts you on kind of the side of the good guys, but not the good guys, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not difficult, even though that's an extreme situation, it's not difficult to see what they're getting at, especially like once you get to one, you get to one part, part of the Metro and there's all these refugee kids coming in from other metros and they're just petting them up in like fenced off areas and they're just like leaving them in there because they haven't got time to deal with them right now. And it's not, it's, you know, as subtle as a brick through a plate glass window. It's not like, <laughs> what, what are they talking about here? But, <laughs> but it's actually kind of a really well done story. It's a good couple of hours as Klebnikov kind of has to put duty versus conscience and then kind of, you know, he changes back and forth and, and there's some action sequences in, and they put they find a way to crowbar in some monsters. And this really good The Thing, John Carpenter's The Thing style section, where you've got a flamethrower, and you're basically making your way through this like body horror cavern where there's slime all over the walls and worms growing out of everything. Nice. And uh, so that that's, that's that bit's just they they put that in just for you, Occam's that bit. Um, nice. And yeah, and it's pretty cool. It, like I say, it's only about two hours long. And it is an interesting story that they're telling, but it's not like go and buy Metro Exodus and, and then play this. It's if you like Exodus, you will be playing it anyway. And if you don't like it, you're not going to be bothered, but it's a cool bit of DLC. It's, a, it's nice to see some story DLC that has its own really good narrative to it, as opposed to just, Oh, and here's a chapter that happens at the end of the game or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it certainly sounds like something worth picking up when they release a game of the year edition. Right. It's not it's not quite spec ops the line, but it is trying to go down that path of like um are we the bad guys, that kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's I played the the I guess when it came out, the the original game or whatever. Uh yeah. the main game, I suppose. Yeah. It's really it's got a light not a lot of nice little moments to it. It's um I wish more people played those games. They're really the the world building for those. And I think I said that when it came out, but it's really spectacular. Uh, it's really, it's a fun series and it's just really, really, really well done. Um, I, I'd, you know, I'd take that over, a uh, battlefield call of modern right. war duty, all that right. shit any day, uh, easily. And, I, and I've, and I've, I've said this in my old review. I said it when we talked about it, Occam's and I said it in my review for the, uh, DLC as well. It depends on how jumpy you are as a person or whatever, but I think that game's terrifying. Like I think Metro Exodus is like a proper frightening breathless kind of jump scary game and it looks so good because the atmosphere and the lighting's incredible yeah but like every time that game tried to scare the shit out of me it basically succeeded every single time but i'm kind of a jumpy person so i don't know if it might not be the same for anyone else no yeah. it definitely the atmosphere nailed it that some of the the, the post-apocalyptic setting especially with like the kind of permanent like nuclear winter kind of thing when you're topside right. in, in Moscow and it just was like oh it was just it was a, it was a wasteland and in a really in a really kind of it was almost almost pretty almost like time had been frozen like how Pompeii right. was just coated in ash and they have these like okay here's how the world was at this moment before everything died there's a lot of scenes like that and you're just like that's fucking nice for this week I've been playing a couple of games uh one of which I can't talk about. I, I've been playing Untitled Goose Game. 
Uh, that is on, on embargo until Friday. So instead, I'm going to go talk about talk a bit about more about uh, Damon X Machina. My review for this game went up last week. Uh, I did enjoy it. Uh, I gave it a, I, I believe I gave it a seven. And the, the things that are good about the game are really, really good. Like the shooting, uh, the the movement of your of your mech uh, character, the the customization options, not just with the different types of weapons you can have, but the different color palettes you can apply. I've seen some really great um, recreations of Zero Suit Samus and her gunship recreated as a mech on Twitter. All people are just oh, cool. absolutely embracing that. Um, the, the aspects about it that, that, that kind of hold the, the product back are, you know, the story is, it's not necessarily hard to follow. It's just, there are massive gaps in it. Like there are so many characters who are brought in for a, a mission and then taken out. And then you don't see them for like another 15 missions that if something dramatic happens to them in that next mission that you see them, it, it doesn't land. Uh, there's, there's a moment in the game where there are two people who are like embracing about to die. Um, and they're, you know, the, the, the strings are playing, the, the music goes all dramatic and their, their voice acting is like, Oh, um, this is the second time I've seen them in the game, so I kind of don't give a shit that they're about to die. Like, it, it definitely undercuts itself. Was one of them a waspy grandmother? Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, I mean, there, there's, I told you guys about this last week after the show, but there's a character in there named artist who is basically just Lucio, like literally just oh, yeah, Lucio, yeah. uh, who, who loves his jams and his street art, but his jams, as you come to find out in this game is fucking rockabilly music. And it makes no goddamn sense. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can buy a hip hop beat for $10 and that's all you need. That's what little Nas X did when he made old town road. So I don't know why Marvelous couldn't do that themselves. But the biggest problem with the game is that the difficulty is kind of all over the place. And then it really dips right towards the end as all of these story elements uh, come to an end. All these story threads, they, they reach their, their end point. And it, it makes sense from a storytelling point of view. But as someone who spent you know, 15 hours really building up uh, not only my, my mech's arsenal, but my skills with my mech, it was really disappointing to just cakewalk through these missions against what are supposed to be difficult bosses only to reach the final boss of the game and continuously have my ass handed to me because it is so fucking hard the boss has so fucking much energy that like the first 15 times i attempted it and that is not an exaggeration on how many times i lost at this boss uh, like i ran out of ammo way before i even got his health down a fourth and so I just had Jesus. to rely on my sword and shield to, to kind of dwindle it down. But even then, it's just like I take a couple hits and I'm done because it is just so fucking powerful. Um, I eventually did figure, figure out a strategy to come around and, and beat him. So, uh, you know, thank, thank, thank God that happened. What is nice is that the last mission of the game is actually divided up into three parts. And as soon as you beat a part, if you lose, you don't have to go back and play that. I know a lot of a lot of games you would have to go back and do all three parts again if you lose at the final boss, but this one just thrusts you right into the final boss every time. So um, I, you know, I'm very happy they did that. You know, there's a lot of other great things about this game. Uh, the music is fantastic. Uh, I don't think I touched uh, I touched about that enough on my review, but I love the soundtrack to this game, and I would love to buy, find a way to buy it. Um, the the one of the most prominent things when it was first announced is you had the the art direction of where the character would be running through the field and there'd be lightning and then it would turn black and white like a like a manga. Uh, that is still super effective. It's not overused, which is really nice, but when it is used, it is just so uh, it, it's a perfect mood setter for it. Um, and then I don't know why in the build up to this game or the lead up to this game, they talked about, you can get out of your mech and explore on the ground. That is the dumbest fucking thing to do in this game. You will die so quickly. You take three shots and you are dead. Why is this an option? Just kill me when my mech is down because my AI companions will never come and heal me. So just fucking game over me instead. I have um, a, a buddy of mine who loves mech games. Yeah. And I remember we, we grew up together and he would, so he'd buy all like the Robotech or Gundam, whatever shit. And that was an option in so many of them. And I didn't get it because that's, yeah, you're like, it'd be like fighting Godzilla, but you're on foot. I'm like, no, he's going to fucking step on you or kick the building you're in. And it's just, 
ah, it was always so weird to me. Like, why would that be a thing at ever? You know, it was. Hey, everyone, in Mario Kart 9, you can now get out of your cart and just run down the track. Like, yeah, really? <laughs> why, why is this an option? Um, yeah. CJ, what's the, um, what's the, how does ice cream play into all this? So, there, so the ice cream mechanic is you go to the shop and you can buy a one scoop or two scoop ice cream. Uh, and you get a cone, a, um, a waffle bowl, or just a regular bowl, and you can choose a one or two scoop. And it's always good to do two scoops instead of one scoop. And basically, you'll have five or six flavors, and you choose one. And then if you're getting two scoops, you'll get another five or six flavors, and you'll choose one of those. And those combine to give you a little enhancement for your next mission. So like your your melee attack may be 2% more powerful. You may not suffer as hard of a knockback from like an enemy club weapon or um, uh, your, your guns may do like one or 2% more damage. So basically okay. going to get ice cream gives you just a tiny bit of a boost uh, for each mission. And you can just keep buying ice cream like f- before a mission. I don't know if all of the enhancements stack. I tried uh, for one of my missions. I, I went and I, and I tried eating a lot of ice cream, and so then I crushed the mission. But then the next one, I didn't eat any ice cream, and I crushed the mission. So it didn't really give me a good idea of of whether it it you can stack and it does help out. Um, and is this just ice cream um, because anime, or is there like lore reason why it's okay. ice cream? There's no, there's no lore reason. Okay. It. it's, it's okay. just anime. There are so many things in this game that need lore reason. It, like, I was hoping it'd just be like ice creams all that's left or something like that. <laughs> but or, it is or a religion. A religion has been built around it or something <laughs> like that. Or uh, like in that Simpsons episode where it rains donuts. I think about that way more than I should. <laughs> um, first of all, it is really like Japanese ice cream because there's green tea and leche, which you know you generally don't find in the in the United States. Um, but the other thing I want to touch on is that you can augment your character. Uh, with enhancements to increase to like if if ice cream gives you a little bit of boost that's temporary enhancements give you a big boost that's permanent but when you augment them you change the look of your character and do you guys remember the episode of futurama where hermes kept getting robotic updates Mm -hmm. it is Mm -hmm. that it is literally that my character right now basically looks like an an ex, uh, what is it from Terminator an exoskeleton no an exoskeleton endoskeleton endoskeleton like complete with just a, a single spine instead of a, a midriff a, mid, a waist uh, with a human head like that is what he has turned into because of the robotic enhancement it looks so fucking weird seeing him run around and also so funny That's to see awesome. him go buying ice cream the T eight hundred endoskeleton exactly. Uh, oh, shit. I was supposed to go last, but I guess I skipped over Occam's. So Occam's. Hey, that's cool. We'll go All back right. to you. Finish you, finish up games with you. Sure. I've, uh, I've played some Path of Exile because that's apparently all I'm going to play forever. I have Borderlands 3 sitting, so that, that'll be fun. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I, the, my, I've talked about it enough, but I did get my I have a, I have a wand because I'm playing a necromancer. And my wand, it looks, appears to be a... Um, a human, like the skeleton of like a forearm and a hand with some muscle on it, which is pretty sweet. <laughs> That's fun. I always like that. Uh, you can get you can get wings in that game. You have to buy them because it's free to play. So they want you to buy the shit. But you can get wings that look like they're made of human hands, kind of stitched together. Which oh is I I may buy that just because it's pretty great. Um, but I want to talk about a movie. This is one I've actually seen before, but I wanted to give it a shout out. It's called Ninja Three: The Domination. No, Chris, you may have you may be familiar with this one. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, I figured. Uh, this is uh, one of the, the the highlights from the Canon films. Who did the Masters of the Universe movie? Uh, God, what, uh, what else do they do, Chris? Over the top. Over the top. Superman uh, four. Yeah. Uh, over the top. Yeah, over. I saw that in the theater. I got an arm um, wrestle okay. to get my son back. I love it. And the, like the the like grip thing. That was when like the. No more bullshit. You reverse the grip, turned, and then he, he turned and he turned his hat backwards. That's how you that was always business. important. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so good. Um, all right, so Ninja Three: The Domination. Now it's Ninja Three, not because there was a Ninja One and Ninja Two, but because they had two other movies with Ninja in the title. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's true. Uh, Nineteen eighty-four is a good year. Uh, opening scene: uh, There's a Ninja assassin, 
uh, is going to assassinate somebody on a golf course and he oh, ends up killing cops. Like, Sorry. Yeah. He ends up killing like 60 cops in an Arizona golf course, which I actually, while watching this, I realized, Oh, that's where, uh, that's where Joe, Joe Arpiro got his start. <laughs> who was the uh, racist garbage monster sheriff from uh, Arizona, which may mean nothing to, to Chris and uh, Charlotte, but he g- Google him sometime. Just Google racist Arizona sheriff. The first thing that pops up. Uh, the the main actress in the movie was the uh, woman who starred in Breaking, also known from uh, Breaking Two Electric Boogaloo, also a canon film. Uh, <laughs> said she's great because she is an aerobic instructor slash telephone line woman, <laughs> right? And apparently, a lot of this came from uh, like Flash Dance was really popular the year before, so they're like, okay, we're gonna like make Flash Dance, so. She's like running around in like a lycra body suit, which is full camel toe the whole time. Uh, and then she's a telephone line woman. So evil ninja goes and kills like 50 cops uh, on a court on a golf course, finally gets gunned down in a really spectacular fashion. Uh, and his body just vanishes into the earth because he's a ninja. You know, that's what they do. And so uh, Breakin lady is uh, out in the desert fixing a phone line uh, where all of a sudden she finds the dying uh, evil ninja. Who proceeds to put a hex on her and then give her his sword, and that's not a euphemism. Uh, and his spirit is trapped in the sword. So now she has this evil ninja sword, and she starts slowly becoming possessed by the spirit of this evil ninja, who is on a, a quest for revenge against the cops who killed him. And <laughs> that's fun because just it's it's good, folks. Uh, and so they decide, like, okay, well, she's possessed by this evil ninja. We got to do something about it. Uh, so they they contact an exorcist, uh, who is played by James Hong, also known as Lo Pan from The Big Trouble in Little China. Uh, and it's determined. Uh, this is the line from the movie, my favorite line from the movie, that only a ninja can kill a ninja, which is something <laughs> I really want tattooed above my dick, by the way. Uh, and it's. It's just perfect because then, uh, what's his name? Uh, Chris, Show what's Kasugi. his name? Joe Kasugi. I love it. Uh, is brought in and he's, he's, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you know more than I do, Chris, but he's like, he was a fairly well known like actor and martial artist and was like an yeah. actual, like legit martial arts teacher before he did the movie thing. And the dude looks just like a badass. Um, so he's brought in as the uh, a ninja assassin of ninja assassins to fight the evil ninja. Long story short, they get they put the evil ninja's soul back into his dead ass corpse, so that's resurrected. Uh, and then there's a big fight scene between him uh, and the evil ninja. Evil ninja's destroyed. Everyone's happy. Want to point out one scene? And you can Google this if you want to. It's on YouTube. There's a kind of seduction scene between uh, Breakin. And and she's by the way she's eighties hot she's like eighties fucking gorgeous right mm-hmm. uh, that thing where it's like the it's like the Billy Joel uh, rock cradle of love video where it's just like a, a like a man's business shirt and she's wearing underwear and like that's what she wears eighty percent of the movie um, <laughs> and, and when she's not in like her ninja outfit killing cops and like bars and stuff uh, but she's she is going to seduce her like one of her uh, cop buddies who's the love interest um, and so she like straddles him. And then proceeds to take a can of V8 juice and seductively pour it down her chest. At which point he like ravenously starts licking it off of her, which is maybe the le- I maybe the least sexiest thing I can think of, other than maybe like trying to lick tuna fish off someone's foot. Oh. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh Chris, do you have any <laughs> do you have any other thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> There's the jump off point. Um yeah. Tuna fish on someone's foot. Chris, do you have any other thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I've not really got much to add. Like, yeah, it's the it's the third film in like a trilogy, which started with Enter the Ninja, and then it was followed by Return of the Ninja. And um, yeah, Lucinda Dickey is the name of the actress. Ah, and, okay. And uh, and she was kind of big for a while after she made that break in slash break dance movie it was called break dance over here because they didn't know whether we'd know what break in was so they, they called it break sure, dance sure. um and yeah so whereas the first two films are like ninjas versus the mafia or whatever this mm-hmm. straight up goes full supernatural and does come up with a pretty cool idea of having like the, um, this lady ninja as well and um but when she's turning into like this ninja it's not like 
it's literally like exorcist style like yeah, her it, eyes go green and she spins around in circles in midair and stuff like that and uh, she's got an arcade machine if i remember in her apartment her apartment like, is fantastic by the way and, um, there's that duran duran album cover art everywhere for rio and, um, this arcade machine just starts firing out neon lasers like into her eyes to turn her into a ninja <laughs> it is well, it looks like the inside of my ass during that colonoscopy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it really does. And the, you remember when uh, Dana was getting possessed by Zool in uh, in Ghostbusters with like just the the like dry ice smoke and the wind and the the weird lighting that happened so much for her. Right, right. Um, and I all I remember is that I remember ending around a church or something, but I do distinctly remember that opening where like the evil ninja turns up and he, and he assassinates the gun and the cops come after him. Like that like Occam's isn't exaggerating. That yeah. scene doesn't end. And he literally kills like, like 60, 70 cops to the point that it's almost like it's like a, a naked gun movie and you're expecting to see like a pile of them getting bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> and, and when you think it's over, when you think they've stopped coming, or like we're about to move on, he'll, he'll like run to a, another bit of the, the golf course and then like another 20 will come on and he'll take yeah. all those out. And it just keeps fucking going. That bit, I wanted to the point that it's so funny. It's a cold open that's a good 15 minutes long. <laughs> right, right. Wow. Yeah, um, I, 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 uh, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it, but, <laughs> but uh, don't listen to me. Just go I, would, I would highly recommend it to everyone. The only thing I can add to this conversation is that James Hong is a national treasure and he deserves an honorary yep. Oscar. That's all I want to say. 380 screen credits. Come on. No one else oh, yeah, has that many. And some really good films as well. Like yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. Chinatown. Right. Yeah. Blade Runner. Blade, yeah. Wayne's World 2. He and so he did good. a bunch of video games, right? He's in, um, he's, he's in Diablo, isn't he? He's in Diablo 3. He's in mm. Sleeping uh, Dogs and uh, Black Ops 2. Covered his shin. Diablo 3. Cover this shin, that's his name. It was driving me mad, yeah. So yeah, um, give him an award. Uh, the James Hong Award for being James Hong. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he also, uh, he also like, helped found some like Asian theater companies, and he's big big in like his Asian culture things in, like, you know, I guess wherever he lives, California, I think. Uh, yeah. But he's, he's like, like, he'll do like the schlocky shit and then do cool stuff and then like probably do things he actually really feels passionate about. That's not Ninja Three: The Domination, but it's uh, <laughs> yeah, no, he's, he's one of those people. You're like, yeah, you're pretty fucking cool. Yeah, James Hong is amazing. And, and, and seeing as we mentioned it, if you're going to watch Ninja Three: The Domination, you might as well watch either Superman Four or Over the Top as well. Like, really, fact, get everyone around and watch all three of them. Yeah, you have a great night. It is and Over the Top. Look at Over the Top. Watch that in the the view that the dad Loki wants to fuck his son the entire movie because there's oh just, just just watch it that way because it'll it it'll work and then in Superman four the evil Superman the best part of like his like ultimate attack is he grows his fingernails kind of like drag queen long and there's so, it's such a good <laughs> such a such it's just like evil fingernails oh it's great and he scratches Superman and Superman looks like somebody just fucked him up the ass with a kryptonite dildo it's so good you are listening to Pontoid that is it for games but we have some headlines to cover it is time for the news And there were a lot of stories this week, but we don't have time to cover them all. Uh, most everything that you heard of from the past seven days came out of Japan, where the Tokyo Game Show took place last week. If you are a fan of Arc System Works fighters, uh, it was a heavenly week for you, as we got another peek at the gorgeous-looking new Guilty Gear, as well as confirmation that May is going to be a playable character. Uh, there were also new trailers and information coming out of the show for games like Dead or Alive 6, Grand Blue Fantasy Versus, Project Sakura Wars, Sonic at the Olympic Games, Warriors Orochi 4, and so much more. Uh, the big game of the show, no doubt, had to be Death Stranding, which, if you can believe it or not, is less than two months away from release. Uh, at Tokyo Game Show, Kojima showed off just under an hour of gameplay, as well as introducing the Safe House feature, which is basically a safe space where Norman Reedus can unwind and relax after doing whatever the fuck you do in that game. Um, and as was so eloquently illustrated... If you are in the safe house and you spend all your time staring at Redis's crotch for too long, he will punch you in the face. Um, Charlotte, 
earlier this year, you pitched a story that about how Death Stranding was the game you were most looking forward to this year. After seeing all the trailers and all the information coming out, do you still feel that way? No, I'm losing interest pretty fast. <laughs> really? He's, it's, they're just going, I feel like Kojima is, I, I know you have to go into PR drive when a game is about to re- be released, but for example, haven't they got like a tie-in with Monster now? Monster Energy Drink, yeah, that was confirmed too. Yeah, and um, just, yeah, it's the whole, I mean, people have been making jokes on social media that he didn't, I I, I guess he, we could make the argument that, that Kojima has matured over time and that's why he's doing done done the whole covering the crotch animation, and he didn't do them with all the female characters in Metal Gear Solid, but rather did right. the complete opposite. Um, I don't know. There's just something about the way it's being advertised, and the the fact that he felt the need to show that much gameplay footage is just telling me that it might not be as good as perhaps I was hoping. Mm-hmm. Um, the whole the fact that it's, a lot of it's walking simulator style doesn't deter me at all. And the fact that the story is complicated doesn't deter me at all, but I feel like they're going too far to... There's something off with the way they're advertising it, and I'm kind of worried that it might be a stinker. Like, it's always it's always makes you nervous when companies don't, for example, don't release um, games to reviewers before the public release date, because then you think they're covering something up. But there's also something to be said about talking too much about a game, about not leaving, like a bit to the um, imagination that makes you think that they might be trying to talk up something that's actually at the heart of it, not that good. Yeah. I think my, my concern for it is that, you know, you have this story that people keep saying, Oh my God, I don't know what's happening with it. And then apparently Kojima himself, uh, I, I don't, I don't believe this for a second, but he came out and said that he may not even be a hundred percent sure what it's about. Um, and so you, you know, you have the buildup of this crazy story and I'm just thinking it's probably going to be the most conventional video game imaginable. Like mm. Metal Gear Solid has, uh, just an absolutely crazy story, but uh, the, the tactical espionage action is, is pretty grounded. You know, it, it, it that is mm. not crazy. That doesn't do anything, uh, uh, so beyond the pale that you, you can't comprehend what's going on, that can't comprehend it. Uh, and I think that that's kind of what. Um, Death Stranding is building up the entire game to be like not just the story but also the gameplay and yet every time I see bits of the gameplay it it just seems okay it just seems like something I've seen kind of before Mm. but I do think that if they're going to introduce Monster Energy Drink they should probably do other companies too like uh, like Hot Pocket and then you have to go to the bathroom five minutes later like that would be a nice addition to it they should just bring in KFC because they're, they're fucking all over everything else at the moment. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, like yeah. DHL. He just like, you know how he's carrying packages. He just like eats it down the hill. Like well, DHL like the baby, do. Just like he gets the little pod with the baby. Just like yeet. I can't believe I said yeet. I'm nearly 40. <laughs> Oh, shit. Okay. Uh, how, do you, right. how do you do, fellow kids? <laughs> <laughs> um, our second story of the week uh, is uh, about the 20th anniversary of the Sega Dreamcast, uh, at least here in the United States. Uh, it was this past, on the 9th, I can't remember what day that it was, uh, Monday? I think that was Monday. Um, and, and really, when 9999 happened here in the United States, it was a legitimate event. I remember like MTV making a big deal out of it instead of playing music videos. Um, I had to wait an entire year to get mine. I couldn't get it at launch. We were still rocking our PlayStation 1 at that point. And I know I've told the story on the site before, but uh, I got my my Dreamcast for Christmas in the year 2000 when my parents bought me and my brother our own individual consoles. He got the PlayStation 2. I got the uh, Dreamcast and we both got our own TVs. Um, and that's always going to be like, like that was such a monumental Christmas for me. It was, it's always going to be my favorite. Um, not just because, you know, I got my own TV and I got my own console, but as a perverted teenager, I got access to internet porn that nobody knew about. Cause thank God that place, uh, that Dreamcast had a modem in it. Cause yeah, the very first day I was alone in the house, that is the first thing I did with it. Um, so I, I just I just loved it. And I wish I was more appreciative of my Dreamcast at the time because you know I eventually got rid of it and moved on to the GameCube. 
Uh, anyone else here have the Dreamcast when it came out? Anyone else stand for it? I picked it up a couple of months uh, after the fact. Um, I just started working at Game Station at the time, um, which is one of the many game shops that I worked for when I was younger. But um, I picked one up uh, with a couple of games. It, it must have been a little bit after release because I remember getting Crazy Taxi for it straight away. And that wasn't a launch game that came out a couple of months later. But I do remember being really pleased with it. I remember taking it home and putting on Soul Calibur first. Yeah. And that seeing that intro and being sold immediately on what I'd bought, like just from the intro, which is kind of a bit, um, you know, stars in their eyes, if you know what I mean. But I remember seeing that intro and, bit, and then playing like that mission mode into like 6 a.m. for like the next five nights straight or whatever. And then Crazy Taxi came out and House of the Dead came out. And I was even a mark for stuff like the um, the VMU and like the way you put the VMU in the back of like the light gun and all of that stuff. I, I thought the Dreamcast was a wiki console. I distinctly remember some magazine over here conveniently like a month after the Dreamcast came out on the front of the uh, the magazine, it was like, we've put this cheats disc together and it's got 10 popular cheats on it. But what they didn't say, but everyone knew, was that disc basically let you play import games on the Dreamcast. And like <laughs> that came out like that came out like a month after. So everybody bought that issue of that magazine. They must have made so much fucking money. And then essentially everyone who had a Dreamcast in this country had the ability to play import games on it. So I just remember getting like Royal WWF Royal Rumble and, and all of this stuff. But um, I thought the Dreamcast was a great console. It looked good. I like the way I like the design of it. I like things like the logo and the boot up sequence and all that. It had, I, I, I like the controller and it sucks because all everyone ever says is, you know, everyone always talks about like a lot of Dreamcast sold and people like it, but it's always spoken about, isn't it? With this whole, oh, I fucking love the Dreamcast. It's one of my favorite consoles of all time. And I'm not saying that people don't think that, but I didn't translate into keeping it alive, did it? No. Which is, well, you people, know, your love of the series is all well and good, but when you can just download the games and play them as easy as like making a CD, it doesn't matter. No one's going to spend, you know, you can get $1,000 worth of software in a night or two. You know, and I love it all day long. Yeah, I'd actually forgotten that it had really easy to crack um like piracy yeah you uh, could you could hack that thing by sneezing on it right yeah i I, mean, it's, it's, I, I have like i have three cd cases in in my house two of which are full of, of like actual dreamcast games that i bought and or were given to me or you know blah 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 then i have one of just shit i downloaded and made because either it was japanese stuff that i couldn't get or it's just games. I was like, "Fuck it, what's this one like?" I mean, it was it was it was like the and this was back in the day when it was like not like downloading outlaws, but I mean, it, the, the, it was a lot easier just to download random shit, especially when you're in college and had a T1 line because that's what your university had. Yeah. Uh, and as real quick, CJ, did yeah. you say Stan? Yes. Okay. Can we let's not do that again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to make this show appeal to youths. Okay. Really. No. Like, okay, well, well, then they're going to love my David Carradine jerking himself off to death. Thing, so. <laughs> if, 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 if CJ promises not to say Stan ever again, I won't say yeet. And then there you go. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> Sounds like a hey, deal. Uh, listeners, your grandparents probably fingered each other to Glenn Miller. How about that? There you go. There, now I made it all kinds of relevant. Uh, I, yeah, I was, I was there when the Dreamcast came out. I remember going to Babbage's and my friend Todd buying it and us playing it. And we spent many, many, many nights playing all the classics and, um, I love it. I absolutely love the system. I said in the comments on Destructor that it was a system that just brought joy. It really did more than any other system I've ever had. It was just, yeah. it, 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 it traded in joy and those games, I mean, there's so much fun to be had. And I don't know if it was a time before games kind of were cynical or, or whatever. It's just it was sort of like we're going to make goofy, cartoony, fun shit. And uh, it really it made a lot of it, a lot of just cool experiences that I kind of wish would, would kind of get a renaissance today. I, I think for me, the the Dreamcast and then the PlayStation 2 and then you know everything, that generation, you know, coming off the PlayStation 1 and the Sega Saturn, there were a lot of ideas that people had for games in that generation that they couldn't necessarily pull off with the hardware. And I think the Dreamcast was like the first great example of all of the ideas actually being able to, to be seen through to fruition a hundred percent, you know, cause 
you're you're so right. It, 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 it traded in fun when you have games like Crazy Taxi or uh, a Jet Set Radio or um, Power Stone. Yes, Power Stone, Space yeah. Channel Five. You know, these were all just all just so much fun to just play. And I, I think you needed that the 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 technology that was in the I guess 128 bit systems over the 32 bit systems to, to really pull it off. So I have a different experience with the Dreamcast. So I was seven when the Dreamcast came out and the following so if it came out on nine nine ninety nine then that means that the month afterwards I got my PS1 for the first time because I got it when my sister was born. And it sort of followed a pattern throughout my entire childhood that I used to get consoles really late. Mm -hmm. And it led to me, I got my PS2 really late. I I completely missed the Dreamcast because by the time it got to that stage of me buying the console, it had completely fallen fallen out of popularity. And then I never got a PS3 until I was like, until 2015, I decided to just get one second hand. So it's, it's kind of like, any sort of short term, uh, any sort of console that didn't last very long, I just completely missed because I was always getting things years late, years late. And um, yeah, at least the funny things like in 2015, when I got my PS4, I was like, whoa, this looks really good. And actually the PS4 was already out for a year. So. <laughs> but, but at least it meant you could like stock up on a catalog of games like pretty cheap, like straight away. Mm. Yeah. And I have, I have no, it's got a bit worse recently, but I have no craving to get things on 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 release i will often get things years after they've come out like games and stuff yeah um though it's it's kind of i i actually cancelled my switch pre-order because i feel bad spending lots of money on new new consoles because of this sort of habit of always getting things really late so i i'm probably still not going to get switch for a while (laughs) I just I I feel bad spending. Does anybody else get that you feel bad spending money on yourself for I, games? Yeah, stuff? I, yeah, yeah. I spent, all the time. I spent sixty dollars on Borderlands Three because I I did my my partner and I will play it together and it's fun for us. But like, yeah, that's weird. Like, I don't I don't like doing that. <laughs> like, I'm I'm such a like Goodwill and like garage sale shopper for stuff that I really just am like, eh. You know why you get this cheaper down the road, but it's you know it's like Last of Us Two. We'll buy that day one, probably the Super Ultimate Collector's Edition, because we fucking love Last of Us. But that's still like it's it's strange. I just I don't buy many games full price, and certainly systems. Oof, that's that's a whole nother thing. I didn't buy a PS3 to like or PS4 rather till got a couple years in, and even then it was like a deal at Best Buy. Listening to Pod Toy. All right, uh, that is it for news, which means we are nearing the end of the show. But before we go, it is time for the Pod Toy question of the week. Hey, bitch, are you too stupid to eat a sandwich or too drunk to keep it down? Sorry, that is not the Pod Toy question of the week. Um, but this quiz question does have to do with food. As you may have heard, Kentucky Fried Chicken is coming out with a visual novel this month called I Love You, Colonel Sanders, A Finger Licking Good Dating Simulator, where you get the romance of the colonel. Fun fact, the actual Colonel Sanders hated KFC for what he did to their recipe. Anyway, for what they did to his recipe. Um, Anyways, that game has me thinking about fast food and all the times they've dipped into gaming. Burger King famously had those Xbox 360 games a decade ago. There's MC Kids and Yo Noid from McDonald's and Domino's respectively back on the NES. Um, While the choice of genre may be out of the ordinary for KFC, it actually fits right in with what they've been doing for the past couple of years and really with the industry at large. So my question is about that. I want to know from you guys, what is a restaurant that should make a game and tell me what their game is like? And Occam's, uh, let's go ahead and start with you. All right. Um, I think I have two. I've been thinking about this a bit. Um, you know, Arby's is the easy target, but I'm going to, I'm going to give them a break for a minute. Cause I feel like, <laughs> you know, they, uh, that they're, it's, it's really, it's fast food roast beef people. If that isn't fucked up enough, then I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> it's fast food roast beef. Uh, true fact. Arby's used to be my favorite fast food restaurant on the planet. No, you, the fr- just get the fries. Seasoned curly fries are wonderful. Everything else, suspect. And I stopped um, going there when they introduced the seasoned curly fries because I hate them. CJ. <laughs> 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 I know I'm not. Uh, 
<laughs> so my game would probably be in uh, uh, based on Hardee's. Do y'all know? I don't think there's a Hardee's over in Europe, uh, huh? There's no way they've no. made enough money to be overseas. We uh, um, the West Coast we are called Carl's Jr. Oh, Carl's Jr.? No, I was just saying we don't even have Arby's. Like, That's fast. Outside of, like, we only just got Taco Bell like a couple of years ago. I, I love like, Taco Bell. Let, let me just say, uh, Chris... Uh, once Brexit goes through and you guys have no more food standards, you will get all the Arby's you can handle because that's the only way it's making it to your country. I guess, yeah. <laughs> once we make that sweet deal with Trump, that yeah. sweet America, America, England trade deal, that the Arby's deal, they'll call it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Occam's. We interrupted you. Go ahead. No, no, it's fine. Okay, so my my game uh, is you go to Hardee's or Carl's Jr. Um, and then you you. You know, so so in order to pick the difficulty, you pick what the menu. So you like say you just want like a I don't know like a, a thick burger and fries. You get like a cheesy chicken fillet on enchilada turnover with a, a side of like grub and nugs or something. I don't I don't know. I don't eat these places. Um, <laughs> and you, but the more you order, the harder the game is. So you eat your meal and then you drive home and you sit. And the game begins when you, your stomach starts to cramp up. And you immediately run to the bathroom. And once you drop your pants and sit on the toilet, that's when the game starts. Because you ever have a, a shit so hard, like so bad that you start sweating and you kind of want to be held after? You all have. It's fine. Right. You don't have to admit it. But we've all had that. I, um, for the third time, I refer to my colonoscopy story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, fair. Uh, it's, it's a good point. Thank you. Um, and, but, and so you're, you're sitting on the toilet and you're sweating and all of a sudden you kind of black out. And when you come to, you are essentially in agony. Uh, the game agony, not in that you're in agony as well, but you're in the game agony. <laughs> Only everything is sort of, everything is sort of, um, uh, what was the word I'm looking for? Like label, like promoted, labeled, covered over with like Hardee's and Carl's Jr. Uh, the fucking commercials. <laughs> the Who star. is that awful cunt? Uh, that awful cunt of a person. Uh, the, the Paris Hilton, her commercial is there for a while and you have to go through the game agony. But it's 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 the Carl's Jr. and Hardy's trying to escape this uh, this transcendental shit you're taking from their garbage food. <laughs> well, that's 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 true survival horror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's good. And Occam's, let me just thank you for not going for the easy joke answer, which was. Uh, the one I was going to go for and say it's based on Subway as an endless runner and you're a child trying to escape Jared. <laughs> um, but for, uh. for, for, for my, uh, my choice, uh, do you guys remember uh, that terrible twin stick shooter hatred? You know, it was black and white <laughs> oh, and you were just yeah. gunning yeah. everyone down. Yeah. Um, so it's that, but instead of going around killing people, committing hate crimes, you're going around committing people because Popeye's ran out of their new spicy chicken sandwich. And so you just go to different Popeye's locations and when they tell you don't, they don't have it, you just start shooting because that's basically what we're about to get to with that fucking sandwich here in America. So that's my game that and the so, run what, from Jared. So what's the deal? Like, cause so we don't, again, we don't have Popeye's here. Is it, they, they've released like a limited edition burger and everyone keeps selling out of it or something like that. Is that what I, the, I didn't realize that it was like a temporary thing. I thought it was something that was going to be permanently added to their menu. But um, something I was reading yesterday, I think, made it sound like it was only a two-week engagement. And uh, But yeah, it was basically like Popeye's chicken is, is it's really good chicken and they've never had a chicken sandwich before. And so they introduced this chicken sandwich and everyone just goes fucking nuts over it to the point where this week – um, I believe they said, and I don't know if they meant this as a joke or serious, that if you would like to try it and we don't have it anymore, uh, order th uh, our chicken tenders and then bring your own bun. Because that's what okay. you want to hear when you're going to a fast food restaurant. Please bring half of the ingredients for your meal yeah. with you. Um, I've, heard that, I've heard that people are like going in and stocking up on them and then standing outside the restaurant trying to sell them at like a markup to people. I, and stuff. I saw a tweet on that and that's the funniest fucking shit because no way, no one on earth is buying a, a, a pre-bought fucking right. chicken sandwich from dude right. on the street. Hell no. I mean, My favorite thing is the guy who stuff. is uh, suing Popeye's because they didn't have the chicken sandwich. And if I read the story correctly, he drove around to like 12 different locations and they were all sold out. And so he's suing them for 
uh, false advertising, and I believe emotional distress because when he told his friends, they laughed at him. Who? Why would you tell people that you drove around to 15 different fast food joints looking for a sandwich? Oh, man. I mean, like, all right, I get it. Let's say you're bored. Maybe you're high. Maybe you have nothing to do today and you feel like kind of living a basic bitch life. I can appreciate that. You drive to 15, you listen to a podcast, maybe you have like friends with you, make it a thing, make it an event. It's like how like uh, well-to-do white people will sometimes go to Olive Garden and pretend like "Mm, we're here. And, you know, then you realize it's garbage food. But it's just, (laughs) I don't, yeah, I don't, suing for it, that, that's, that's, well, it's just going to get thrown out. But that's really sad. I feel sorry for that person. Yeah. Uh, Charlotte, you have an answer for this? Okay, so I have two. Um, you've you've heard of Nando's, right? You, everybody's heard of Nando's. Well, I have. No. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have that it's, over it's, here. We have Arby's. Yeah, yeah, it's like, I think it's originally from South Africa, but they do spicy chicken. And there was one point in the UK about 10 years ago where everybody was talking about Nando's and about having a cheeky Nando's in uh, quotation marks. And it was excruciating. Um, my idea was some sort of Orwell type political thriller where all the influencers start talking about cheeky Nando's again. And you have to discover what has gone wrong in the system. Like who is taking advantage from like screwing with all these influencers to get them to tweet it and to not tweet Instagram about Nando's. So it's like (laughs) some sort of like government conspiracy or yeah. Yeah, cheek, cheeky Nando's is like up there with Mackie D's. It's just a term that I really, it kind of makes my spine tingle when people say it. <laughs> I just, where people are like, let's go, uh, wh- where are you going? Mackie D's. Or where people go, should we go for cheeky Nando's? I'm just like, mm. what? That's not Bant's or whatever. That's not I mean, it's, it's, it's also, it's like a full meal. Like, <laughs> how can it be cheeky? It's like you're having a full meal of, you can get, you can order a whole chicken there, like, Cheeky sounds like you're just having a snack. But for, for like our American listeners, which is probably all of them, um, for you ten guys, um, it's it, it's it's like spiced chicken, isn't it? It's like, um, but mm. but not like peri peri chicken. Yeah, it's peri peri. It's um, and it's delicious. It's fucking great. Uh, but but peri peri chicken is available from other restaurants, by the way. Mm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not not endorsing it here. Cheeky Nando sounds like the underwear you want to wear when you know you're going to get laid on a date. <laughs> mm, yeah. Okay, but my second one is you will definitely not have heard of Weatherspoons. It's a chain of, um, like, it's more of a chain of pubs where you can also order food that's just been blitzed in the microwave for 30 seconds, but it's somehow <laughs> still kind of delicious. Oh. Um, but the owner of this chain is a renowned Brexiter. And he is um, basically uses his his company ownership to sometimes to support Brexit. And my idea was that the cl- clientele is going to be increasingly Brexiters because of people boycotting it. And you have to go into Weatherspoons and you have to do some sort of Phoenix Wright style sort of um, presenting evidence and shouting objection to sort of argue why Brexit is a terrible, terrible idea. I'd play that. I, ju- I just go into like restaurants and do that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are just about out of time. But before we go, Occam's, do we have a community shout out this week? We do. I'm going to give a community shout out to user Absolute Freak, uh, whose uh, avatar is uh, Cyan from. Final Fantasy III, uh, my favorite character and my favorite video game of all time. Uh, but his the actual reason I'm giving them a shout out is uh, their wife uh, had a uh, absolute wife, as, as he calls them, had a, was a bit of a cancer situation, um, mm-hmm. the, and they took a genetics test, came back with good results, and they had a, a lump was removed, uh, and and things are looking better now. The surgery went well, and and she is recovering. So I just want to give a shout out to him and to to his wife, and I hope that she's resting and everyone's doing okay. And uh, so shout out to Absolute Freak and them and theirs, and just a good road to recovery from here on out. That's awesome. That's great to hear. Yeah. Uh, all right. On behalf of Chris, Charlotte, Occam's, and myself, thank you for listening to Podtoid. And don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Podbean, and the Destructoid YouTube channel. Thank you.